Yeah, let me just start with a, a simple case. You know, an eight-year-old falls for us often from a monkey bar or playground structure or something from a height, and they have a significantly uh, displaced supracondylar fracture, as you can see here. And the radial nerve is out, and, and we'll walk through this a little bit in, in detail, but, you know, standard treatment is reduce the fracture anatomically and stabilize it. And the question for us today is going to be, what about the nerve or what about the vessel or what about both? Um, so the standard of care really is to uh, reduce this fracture and stabilize it. But in some of the type three series up to 49%, roughly about 20 to 40% will have a nerve injury and somewhere between three and 18%. And again, it, it, it is whether you include the type twos or the type threes alone will have a vascular injury and about 30% are gonna have both the nerve and vessel out. So from the fracture vantage point, it's, it's male unions, the problem and loss of motion and, and the aesthetics of, of a crooked arm. But from the neurovascular vantage point, as we're going to delve into, it's a lot more than that, because now you're starting to talk about the hand. We're not talking about the distal humerus anymore. We're talking about the hand and how the hand functions. And that's near and dear to everybody on this talk. Uh, so here's what it looks like. You, you know, this kid's arms on the fractures table. You can see the ecchymosis. If you look really closely and we'll get it from a different view, this skin is puckered. Uh, there's a pretty prominent metaphyseal spike when we look at the x-ray um, and the fracture is way out in valgus. And so if we're going to approach this, we're going to have to come anterior medial uh, to take a look at it. And here it is from the side, you know, pretty puckered, pretty deformed, pretty swollen. Uh, here's an illustration from uh, Don in my book, but you got to get that spike out from the brachialis and you can sometimes do that closed with manipulation um, and kind of milk that uh, fracture out. And then once you get it untethered and hopefully when you untether the brachialis, you untether the nerve and the blood vessel and then reduce it, you know, and so you're going to get your reduction both visually, like what does it look like? Um, if you do it a lot, you get a tactile and you can really get so you can tell like this is bone on bone or there's some soft tissue still in here. And what is that soft tissue? And similarly, fluoroscopic, either that door is completely shut or part of the door is still open. And then you have to decide what's in the door that's preventing it from being anatomic. Uh, Scott, I just started to freeze. Let me see if this will go. So, so here's the fracture you know, madly displaced. And I'm gonna use this control and you can see where the metaphyseal spike is and you can see how far away things are and where we gotta to get to. And we gotta bring this back safely. Uh, and then we gotta pin it. And it can be with two or three lateral entry pins that one of which should cross the olecranon fossa. So you get more than one column stabilization. Um, and then if need be, you have to go medially and, and there's nothing against going medially as long as you protect the ulnar nerve. So simplistically, most of the time the injury is responsible for the nerve vascular uh, problem. You know, so here's a tethered uh, vascularity. Sometimes it's chronic, uh, you know, and so besides the injury, sometimes the surgeon's responsible for the things that we do. And so here's a pin from the medial side that's got the ulnar nerve. Uh, and, and sometimes it's both, and that's what we have to sort out. And so here's an entrapped median nerve that was not recognized, and, and now it's been in there a long time, and what are you going to do about it? And, and ultimately, this is the entire point of this conversation. We don't want this. We don't want a Volkman's ischemic contracture. Uh, that's our goal in all this, you know? And, and I'll tell you, and this really is where we get the pink pulseless. You know, sometimes it saw me, but I didn't see it. Uh, axiom is really important. And so you got to increase your index of suspicion and you can't, can't walk away from things that may not be right. Um, this is pretty straightforward, right? You look at the upper left and the upper part of this arm is pink. And although there's betadine on this arm because we're in the OR, everything from that fracture site distal is white. You know, that's an avascular limb and this uh, artery was disrupted and, and it needed a vein graft and it needed promptly before it had an avascular forearm compartment or an ischemic intrinsic muscles to the hand. Um, in terms of the nerve, there's pretty critical questions, you know, how common. So we just talked about in superconnor fractures, pretty common. Um, what's the role of observation? And we'll get to that, but fortunately uh, most recover. 
Uh, what's the utility of electrodiagnostics? And I'll you know show the card early, but it's not as valuable in kids as you think. Um, and then what are you going to do? When are you going to acutely explore? And when are you going to go late? And when are you going to reconstruct? And as you all know, it's a race against time, right? It's reinnovation versus modal end plate. Kids are very forgiving of us, but they're not completely forgiving. Like we can, we can end up with a hand that doesn't work forever. So you got to sort out <clears throat> kind of what's going on and your timetable has to accelerate in children because their recovery is faster. And I'll give you some data. It really starts with a complete exam, right? Including the anterior for the FPL and the FTP to the index. Uh, it really starts with a fracture treatment, like get it right get it right. And if it's not right, figure it out. And if it's a deviation from your expected norm, don't say, oh, it's okay, because it may not be. And you may be into a situation that you and they are not going to be happy with in the long run. You know, here's somebody who left this radial nerve under a plate for 18 months. That was really hard to, to reconstruct and solve later in this proximal humerus. Uh, so do your exam. The, the nerve and vessels can be stuck inside that fracture site. So go after them. Uh, so this is, you know, in open injuries, we do acute explorations. Anytime we're going to the fracture, we look at the nerve and the artery. If the nerve was truly intact and we did a really good exam and it's out afterwards, don't say, oh, it's okay. Cause it's probably not okay. Like that uh, median uh, pin that was in through the ulnar nerve. Uh, and most of the time you can observe and you can, and it'll get better. That's the vast majority, but it has to be within the expected time frame. And I'll give you some data on that. <clears throat> so comprehensive physical exam, don't be fooled. If the hand's down or it's in a splint and it's down and you ask them to extend their fingers and the, you do this, every one of you understand that's intrinsics, you know, passively or actively get their wrist up and ask them to do this. If they can't do that, nerves out. So don't be fooled by things like that. It's really hard to touch test sensation in the kids. You can use emergent tests and other things. Don't make assumptions. And this won't have to do with supracondylar fractures, but glass, glass is bad, it cuts things. You know, even glass through little tiny holes cuts things. So this was somebody who left this musculocutaneous nerve that was cut for about 13 months. Uh, you know, that's, don't, don't wait. Indications for acute exploration, open fractures. We, when we open, and it's about 8% of the time for us, we look at the nerve and artery every time, and often we end up decompressing it. This is pretty obvious, right? You're going to look at this nerve and artery, but this is very rare. Closed fractures that you are gonna open for open reduction internal fixation. Again, take a look. You know, bad fracture, you can't get it back. You have to open it. And if you have a nerve deficit after treatment, I, I, I often test this, but this is like the kindergartner in, our, uh, in America with a crayon test. Like when you write on the wall when you're a little kid and your mother walks in the room and says, did you write on that wall? In that minute, you either own it, yes or no. Did you do a thorough exam of this hand before you went to the operating room? And if the answer is no, just say no, because that changes the treatment. If you say yes, and everybody banks on that, we're down a different pathway. The majority of nerve injuries after pediatric fractures recover fully and spontaneously. I probably will say that a hundred times, but I live and many of you live at the end of a funnel. And at the bottom of that funnel is where the trouble is. And so when they consult on you, don't assume that you're way up at the top of the funnel because you may be at the bottom. Recovery is different. So medians recover faster than radials, recover faster than ulnars, recover faster than brachial plexus. And this is well documented in the literature. Signs are sequential. Initially, they can't feel. Then they get pins and needles. And then sensation comes back. The Tenel's advances, these are fundamental, you know, observations of physical exam. And the motor recovery is from proximal to distal. We don't find the EMG and nerve conduction study all that helpful because to be honest, it's too optimistic because a lot of these nerves aren't either black or white. They're partially entrapped and long-term, they're not as good if they're still entrapped or they're still tethered. 
So we don't use it as much. <clears throat> so back to the supraconal fracture. It's about 12 to 16% of all fractures will have compromise, but it's 20 to more than 40% of the type threes as you see here in the clinical and radiographic images. Direction of displacement is pretty simple. You're all great anatomists. If the fracture goes post your lateral, the median nerve's in trouble. The fracture goes post your medial, the radial nerve's in trouble. If it's a flexion injury, which is about 2%, the ulnar nerve's in trouble. And actually up to 30% of these bad fractures will have multiple nerves. So don't just examine one nerve and say, I got it. Examine them all and believe if more than one's out, that more than one is out. Check the AIN, it, it's injured a lot more than you think. So type threes, no cortical contact, unstable, high risk of neurovascular compromise, high risk of malunion. Get an anatomic reduction, whether it's you or your pediatric orthopedic partner or your trauma surgeon on call, and then observe the nerve recovery, but be thorough in your exams and respond to the unexpected. So we wrote a series of 244 kids who had neurovascular injuries over about 4,000 surgically treated patients, but the type twos were included. Standard age, 6.7 years was the mean. 29% had a vascular injury. Most common injury was the median nerve, about 62%. Roughly 80% recovered pretty quickly and the median time is 2.3 months. We, these are not adults. If their nerve is okay, it comes back fast, faster than usual, and it comes back in sequence. Here's the diagram, 64% median, 24% radial, less than 1% ulnar and 11% uh, multiple nerves, right? So you're talking about nearly 90% of the time it's median or it's radial nerve that you gotta sort out. When you look at timing, median recovers faster, radial recovers slower, right? So most are gonna get a full recovery but radial nerves, multiple nerves will take longer, but the recovery is faster, about 80%. So if you don't have signs of recovery coming at three months, you should start to get a little concerned if you're observing. And if you don't have something at eight months, you ought to start thinking about 15 blade and a look. So the decision is really acute. Do I look at this nerve and artery right now, or do I look at three to six months? Not 12 to 18 months, three to six months. Your exposure op options, if you look, is extensile. We use a transverse incision at the fracture site. And then if we have to extend it, we do, even with open fractures. And there'll be better pictures of this. If you go late, it's because you failed to re get recovery in the expected time. I'll touch on this more. But that expected time is much shorter than adults. And those of you who mostly uh, treat adults and tra take trauma call or consult in a pediatric hospital, it's faster. We uh, want to look at this, but most are kinked and entrapped. Very few are lacerated, but some are. Here, here's an uh, observation of an ulnar nerve that was entrapped in a fracture site. Intrinsics were out for a long time. You don't want to lose your intrinsics for a long time. This is the usual sort of vessel problem and the nerves right next to it. It's either going to be tethered, which is the most common, or it's gonna be entrapped, which is more problematic. The site of compromise is always at the fracture site. We do not get arteriograms, but this, somebody got this one for me. So it's a beautiful illustration. That thing is kinked or entrapped after their close reduction and pinning. Don't wait on this. This is a Volkman's ischemic contracture waiting to hurt that kid mostly, and then ultimately you. It's usually entrapped or kinked, but this is the consequence if you don't promptly recognize and treat. And this is this kid's, the rest of this kid's life. And, and it's in a sense, truly in our minds and in our hands. So when to open, open fractures are easy, but then look at the neurovascular bundle. Vascular insufficiency that persists after skeletal alignment and an inadequate close reduction, and that's the hard one. What is inadequate? What's not good enough? We looked at 8% back in 2001. We repeated it again. That number has been pretty consistent for us. About 8 to 12% of the time, we have opened these. What's acceptable? So now you get to be the trauma surgeon, but you got to get Bauman's angle back where it belongs. You got to get 
that just a humorous aligned, you got to take care of translation to an acceptable way, and it can't be male rotated to a great degree. If you're going to approach it almost every time you're coming from the front, most of you are comfortable in this area. Not every trauma surgeon is, but most of you are. So you may get called in if you're not the trauma surgeon to do this. 98% of the fractures go into extension. Go anterior medial, uh, excuse me, go medial for the flexion type, find the nerve vascular structures and decompress them. Remove the interposed tissue, get an anatomic reduction. These are skills every trauma surgeon and every hand surgeon who's a consultant really should have. Simple, you know, here, superficial down, you folks are great anatomists. We don't lose, use longitudinal incisions. We release the bicep and laparoneurosis. We look for the, you know, antibrachial cutaneous. We come down and we release the lacertus and identify the neurovascular structures. You, you can get to the radial nerve quite easily and that's where you're sorting out the most of the time your anterior medial, sometimes your anterior lateral. So the BR, BR interval. Put the arm out the side, put the fluoroscopic machine up above. We rarely use a tourniquet and then we come down. We start with a transverse incision at the fracture site. Most of the time, because everything's blown apart, this is fine. If we have to, we extend up the medial aspect of the arm. And if we have to, we go down. And if it's a very late presentation, you got to release the compartments. You go all the way down. But that initial transverse incision is very aesthetic. You can see it here. If it's already open, it's quite easy. You just use what you're given, right? You come down, you identify the aponeurosis, you move the basilic out of the way. You got to identify the artery and the nerve. If you have to, you got to identify the radial nerve. But if you go right at the fracture site, it's going to be hard to see. So you got to look above and you got to look below first. And then oftentimes they're just in traps. So the shoulders above, the wrist below, and you got to move them out of the way. But sometimes they are literally in the fracture site and you got to be very delicate in your extraction uh, of taking the brachialis and the flexor pronator mass out and the periosteum, which is inside of there and then the neurovascular structures. So we work on both ends and work our way back to this. And you can see this thing is kinked and stuck. And then we try and get them out and out of the way. And hopefully, hopefully they'll have normal flow after you untether them. But if they don't and they have an injury, you have to resect that and you have to graft that. And now you're into a compartment syndrome concern that's higher. Right, and now you got this big operation, but hopefully you have stayed out of danger for this kid. And really your job is to save this kid's hand, hand function for the rest of their life. You don't wanna be in this game, right? You don't wanna be putting a free gracilis on here. If you have to, that's our job, but you would like to never have to do this if you can. So again, decompress and then reconstruct if you have to. The hardest decision is in the pink, pulseless hand. Like how pink is good enough? How, how faint of a pulse is okay? This is a Chuck Folk Goldfarb case. This is really rare. But after they pulled this out, this thing had no flow, right? They took it out. They had to graft this, right? This is what you're trying to prevent, a lifetime of this. A white hand's easy, requires immediate exploration. A pink pulseless is harder. You reduce it, you pin it, it's got a pink pulseless hand. Now you're saying, is this anatomic? Is this good enough? Are the nerves intact? How pink is pink? Now, what is capillary refill good enough? Is that too sluggish or is it brisk enough? Is the pulp okay? Has it got great turgor? Do I use ultrasound in the operating room? Do I get an arteriogram in the operating room? Do I observe this or do I explore this? If you do your urgent close reduction and pinning and you've got a pink pulseless hand and the median nerve is out, the risk of ischemic contracture of Volkmans is higher. If you're gonna not explore, you gotta observe them for longer. Don't send them home. You gotta tell your phone room when they call, don't tell them it's okay. Tell them to come in immediately. It's a high risk situation. Again, keep them in the hospital longer. Notify everybody, any negative change means you come see us. Do not deny a compartment syndrome is developing. 
So that then leads to the question, should we open all of these in some places in the world do? If your normal nerve is in, you got a little bit more of a help because of nerve function and pain perception. And around the world, everybody views this differently. One of the keys is don't go by the five P's of vascular insufficiency in adults. It's the three A's. Are, are they asking for more medicine? If you anatomically reduce that fracture, they don't need medicine. If they have ongoing ischemic contracture, they do. If they are anxious in their bed, start to get really worried. If they're really agitated, get really worried. When we look, look for long-term of pink pulse list that did not get into trouble, they had still abnormal blood flow 41% of the time and they had increased collateralization. And these kids just barely missed a bullet. So 41% versus 6% on the opposite side. You have a major risk of missing an avascular hand or a hand that will never work well again. This is the only time in my career I had to do this, but this kid came in to see me six days after an avascular hand. We revascularized him from his axilla to his hand and he was viable for about 72 hours and he lost his hand. Like I've only been in this once. You don't ever, ever want to be in this. So you get to this problem in binary, no pulse, go to the OR, no pulse in the OR, no normal hand. Do you just do an open reduction internal fixation? I'll sound like, you know, maybe even arrogant. Maybe we think we're smarter than that. So we don't, don't do binary, but it may be risky, right? Oops, I hit the wrong thing. You know, if we have a pink pulsus and we think we're smart enough that we have normal capillary refill, normal turgor, a strong Doppler, Sometimes we get away with observing these hands, but I'll tell you in observing these hands, we have a very low threshold for exploring and decompressing and revascularizing either, either promptly or later. But it's a, it'd be in a very interesting debate amongst this you know, forum of highly educated people here today. What, what do you do in this circumstance? So if you get it and it's back, and it's viable, that's easy, but this is not a zero risk solution a situation. So I appreciate the opportunity to join this forum and, and share some thoughts with everybody this morning. It's terrific to, to get together, especially while still COVID is changing. Um, you know, it's a lot of fun to join my friends around the world. Uh, and I thank you very much for letting me join in this morning. I will stop sharing my screen. Peter, that was a fantastic talk as expected. Um, I have a few questions if you, if you wouldn't mind answering Please. them. Yep. So I noticed that when you show the one fracture pinned with three lateral diverging pins, that you used big pins. Can you just give a quick conversation about pin size in children? Yeah, so the first I'll tell you is kind of a funny story. So I, I did both, uh, besides my orthopedic training that some people don't know me, I did a year of pediatric orthopedics and a year of hand surgery. And, and then I came on staff at Children's and, and the second of my fellowships was my hand surgery. So I was used to these tiny little pins. And so they put me on call literally July 1st weekend of when I started on staff as expected. And so I pinned all these fractures with my little hand pins. And, and when they ran the X, those are the old days, you'd look at all the x-rays every Monday morning and every, and so it was Tuesday morning. Everybody's like, what the hell are those pins, right? So it was kind of comical. But the, but the second real reason is I think that you can get away with less risk of fractures moving if you use a little bit bigger pins. So that's first, bigger pins uh, were helpful. Uh, and then the second is you, you have to be certain that you get at least two cortices with each pin. And ideally, sometimes you can get three and in a sense four cortices if you go through the electron on fossa. So big pins, if you only are using lateral entry, divergent, and use as many pins as you need so that that fracture is stable. So I've had some fractures in which I have three lateral and one medial pin in. Um, and for the audience, I've taken trauma call, four fractures in kids as much as I have hand and microvascular, et cetera. So I've pinned all these things. Just get the fracture stable so it won't spin out on you, even with your pins in. 
And Peter, do you deem stability under fluoroscopy or just yes. clinically? So I stress the fracture under fluoroscopy and with my hands. And if I'm in doubt, I pin it because that seven-year-old or that five-year-old, they're going to do a lot more when they're awake and alive than you're going to do in that operating room, you know? And so they can bend and they can twist and they can displace things. So be certain you get stability. Okay. Peter, second question. You know, we all know that advancing to knowledge is a good sign for recovery in adults. How do you assess it in children? I, I think you, I, and Scott, I think you know this and probably most of you, I think they will give you an advancing to nose because they'll jump, right? And, and they'll jump all the way down their forearm. Uh, so I think you can get it. And the older kid will tell you the same way an adult is, but mostly they'll, they'll retract from you. And so you can, you know, here it is at the fracture site and it hasn't moved and now it's in the mid forearm and you got a lot more sense of maybe we're okay here. But if it's still stuck at the fracture site and it's really hyper reactive, and that kid's got nothing, ask for a 15 blade. Don't wait, ask for a 15 blade. And don't rely on your EMG and nerve conduction study to make you feel good that it's okay. Yeah, just to emphasize that point, we saw a kid on Friday who had a median, who had a supraconular pin, three lateral divergent pinning, and is now six months out uh, with no median nerve recovery and no advancing to nose. And we booked them. We booked yeah, her. So yeah, so you, I can tell you, you will do much less harm in this. And now we're at the end of the funnel. Don't, don't miss, don't let me misrepresent myself. We're talking about we're at the end of the funnel, like Scott's talking about. But you'll do much less harm as a skilled surgeon with a 15 blade than you will by feeling okay with your EMG that it's going to be all right. And you wait longer because those motor end plates are going away while you're waiting. Here, another question. Why do you think the median nerve injury can seal some of the signs and symptoms of the compartment syndrome? Is it just uh, that the nerve? Go ahead. So I'll, I'll try as best I can. The first is that when you look at the topography of the nerve, the AIN is right next to the fracture site, right? So that's why if you don't do a good FPL, FDP uh, exam, you're going to miss a lot of AINs. Um, the, the next is that if you lose sensation and most of the sensation to our fingers comes through the median, you lose a lot of information about pain pretty quickly, right? So when that nerve stops working for pain, you lose a lot of information. That, that, that's my assessment. I don't know what yours is, Scott. Yeah, I think some of it is exactly what you're saying, Peter. And some of it I think is, since it's adjacent, sometimes they're just primary ischemia to the muscle. And for mm -hmm. some reason, it's not as painful as a full-blown compartment syndrome, primary ischemia. Dan and I have talked a lot about this because you do see kids who don't have the classic signs and symptoms and yet present with the Volkmans. Right. So, the, the last I would say is, and, and you, you know this because you do uh, a lot of plexus like I do, every adult who has a terrible plexus injury has excruciating or severe or at best mild pain. 3% of our brachial plexus kids, even the kids who are older, have actually true pain. So there's also something about the physiology of the nerve of the kid or the pain receptors of a kid that are different is, is also my second answer to that. Yeah. And then I want to, Dave, one more thing, I'll, I'll, we'll move forward. And so I have to just tell a story. When I visited Peter, like David did, it was a monumental experience in my career. And I remember Peter telling me that if you're making rounds, you pin a supraconal fracture and you're making post-op rounds and you go into the room and the kid's watching TV and not paying attention to you, then you can go home. Same scenario, you're making post-op rounds, the kid's fidgety in bed and he can't focus on the TV and he's needing a little bit more pain requirements, you can't go home, bottom line. It's quite simple, right? So I think once you pin a fracture in a kid, whether it's a supraconal or a form or whatever, their pain goes away. They don't need narcotics. They're needing narcotics or they can't focus on the TV or they're agitated. You need to have a second thought about what's going on in that particular child. David, any more comments or questions? Uh, I, I, I would just, uh, I think the, the, as Peter's emphasized, the, the risk of doing harm by having a look at the nerve and, um, and the artery in particular is, you know, it should be small and therefore the, the balance of risk and benefit here is, uh, I, I've got a pretty low threshold. If I'm ever asked to get involved in one of these things, I'm very 
keen to open it up and explore it. But I absolutely that that recognition of anxiety in the child as as a sign uh, is critical. Yeah, and, the, you know, it's, and Peter, it's a Peter, really good message. One more quick question. I think the hardest ones to diagnose are those partial nerve injuries. Right. You know, where a piece of the nerve is stuck in the fracture and a piece is not stuck. Any tricks for the, the, making the diagnosis or intervening or whatever? So uh, I, you know, it's that kindergarten test a little bit, but I think actually Scott and, and everybody on this call is, uh, you know, uh, a physical exam expert, but I think it starts with your exam prior to your fracture treatment, right? You, you gotta be patient and you can get that kid to give you a good hand exam. Uh, or you have to say, I don't know, right? But but I think physical exam matters for that partial. Uh, and then, and I tell you, it's if it's just not right, um, ask for the 15 blade. And uh, and that's not it. That's not an arrogant statement. That's just like like you people know how to go expose a nerve, you know, or you have a friend who knows how to go expose a nerve in an, in an artery, and just look at it. You'll do much less harm with a small incision than you will sitting on a hand that's uh, denervating or devascularizing and turning ischemic because uh, you can't ever go back on that. And Peter, could you just explain the kindergarten crown test to everyone? Yes. <laughs> so the kindergarten test is, you know, and, and I, I was not a very good kindergarten. I was a very poor behaving, behaving child. But like you're, you got your crayon and you're writing on the wall and, and, and then you, the crayon goes down because you hear your mother stomping into the room and, they, and she asks you, did you write all over that wall? You got like a millisecond to decide yes or no. But when you go, no, I didn't write on the wall, right? You're never retracting from no. Like you will go to your death with no. So the same thing, you know, and, and we're all good, honest people. We're just human. If, if you ask the resident or the registrar or whoever it may be, did you examine that nerve and was intact? It's the crayon test, right? If they say yes and it's okay, now you got to decide. Or they say, uh, you know, no, I didn't. That takes courage for them to say no, right? Or if they say, I couldn't get a good exam. So we try right from the beginning to teach our people, it's okay to say, no, I didn't. I was too busy. I was too tired or I don't know, I didn't get a good exam. Because otherwise they will go, literally they will go to their deathbed saying, yes, I examined that nerve and it was okay. It's just human nature. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a great test, you're gonna use that. Uh, Grania, you had, a quick, you had a comment? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Peter, that was brilliant. I, we're you know, totally advocates of opening if there's any question at all about um, um, the neurovascular status. Um, so I'm really glad that you said that. Um, sometimes there's a bit of a resistance from some of the orthopedic colleagues about opening in the pink pulses hand. Obviously, I'm coming from plastic surgery. So, you know, it's really good to have evidence to support that. Um, the one thing I would say is we actually do a more lat a medial incision, which is straight line down by the um, basilic so we take we can take a vein harvest on the way in you know to the upper arm here right make the axis like that down uh which is which is slightly different to what you do but um it's the same kind of idea but it's it's kind of a good tip i learned from simon knight actually if anybody if you know him he's one of my senior colleagues dave knows him well uh, so you can harvest the vein graft if you need it on the way in or just have it banked right I so I, that's so helpful so I, yeah. I don't disagree there. in that original yeah. look, the, the reason we go transverse first is that it, in the end, it looks like a part of your elbow crease. And about 75% of the time, the nerve is kinked and, and not thrombosed and the intima is okay. So if you extract it and their pulse comes back and their O2 saturation goes up, their aesthetics of that as a plastic surgeon you can appreciate is off the charts. And because the brachialis is all blown apart, you can see everything through that. If, if you then need to get a vein graft, which I agree with you, you can get locally, you just do a, you know, a hockey stick up to where you like to be to begin with and do exactly what you're talking about. And if it's really longstanding and you have to release the compartments, or decompress further, you can then do a Z the other way. So I agree with you, medial down, across, 
and then down the lateral side of the form if you have to. We just start transversely because more than a three quarters of the time, all you got to do is pull the artery and nerve out if you're there acutely, right? If you're being called in late, you know, then then you need a more extensile exposure. Yeah, perfect. I agree. That's all. We do the transverse as well, obviously. I was just saying about harvesting the nerve and the, or the vein on the way in. Thanks. Yeah, but we, it's really good to hear about the. Yeah, and the last thing, which I think we're saying exactly the same thing, so I'm just trying to agree with you. You can get the vein right in the arm. You don't have to go anywhere else. Um, thanks, Scott, the, uh, for letting me join you. This is terrific. A lot of fun. Th thanks very much, Peter. Um, Zesco, we'll have one very quick question because I think it's such an important topic. We can sort of run a little. Uh, Zesco had a question about the triphasic flow what flow or flow curve sheet shape in pink pulseless hand might be considered safe not to be operated? So, so you mentioned triphasic is what you really need. Yeah. Any so, flattening so I, of that is not good enough. Yeah, I, I think you need a triphasic flow if you're going to go by that. I don't think there's a perfect test, you know, so it, it's, you know, it, it's like the statisticians as you start to combine uh, multiple factors, but but I, I think you got to have a really good flow. You can get away with biphasic some of the time, and you can get away with a partially kinked artery, as we talked about with the collateralization that we can see in those long-term follow-up studies, right? So if you're getting some flow and you get collateralization, that's the biphasic that may turn out to be okay. But, but the weird thing is, I'm sure those of you who've been are getting as old as I am, You'll, you'll get some of these kids who look like they're okay and then they and and they were just on the edge and they hit adolescence and they start growing and suddenly they get things that they haven't been experiencing because they've had compressed nerves and arteries for a long time um, you know and so uh, I just I just be wary and that's why you're either a black or white person or if you are accepting gray you got to be very very attentive to detail and so if you have a practice in which, they go away and they go live in another country or another part of your country, like the United States is big and they go away, you, you've lost them, you know? And so that's when uh, I think the next test sometimes, Dave, and you've already said it is you ask for a 15 blade, you know, and, and you go look. Thank you. I completely agree. So thanks very much, Peter. Uh, we'll let you get back to your family. You've got, they're all waking up, I think, aren't they? Is that the... Yeah, all right. I got a massive proof. Thanks, everybody. So great to see my friends and meet some new friends. Be well. Thank you, very Peter. Very good. Cheers. Bye.